Hi, my name's Sean Caulfield. I write Clojure for a living using the Atom Editor, the Chlorine plugin, and Cognitech's Rebel data visualization tool. After my last screencast, several people asked me to go into a bit more detail about depths.edn and the CLI, and in particular how aliases work. So that's what we're going to do today. For a lot of people, I've recommended looking at my dot closure repo. Um, this is a depths.edn file that I've pulled together over time. I've been using the CLI and depths.edn for quite a while now. And I've gradually put in there all of the tools that I like to use, or that at least I want to try out from time to time. The way that the CLI and the depths system works is that in addition to the basic dependencies that you have in your depths.edn file, you can specify aliases, and you can choose to run with or without those aliases. You can combine the aliases, and in each alias you can specify extra dependencies, you can specify uh, versions of dependencies that should override things you already have, uh, you can specify uh, JVM options, you can specify a main option, uh, a namespace to run, and so on. So let's take a look at uh, a basic project here. I've got an empty depths.edn file here, and if we ask the command line tools to describe the environment, you'll see I'm on uh, 1.10.1447 of the CLI tools, which I think is the latest one. Uh, it tells me which config files it's going to use. Now this is quite important because this determines which versions of Clojure, which dependencies, which aliases, and which other tools you're going to get. So here we see there's the installation depths file, and if we actually go look at that, we'll see that it's fairly small, uh, and it sets the defaults for the CLI. So by default, it's going to look at Clojure code in the source directory. It's going to use Clojure 1.10.1 because it's the latest version of the CLI tools. Uh, it has two aliases here. If you specify colon depths as an alias, it will pull in a specific version of tools.depths.alpha you can work with. And if you specify the test alias, it will also search for closure code in the test folder tree. And then finally, it specifies the two default Maven repos that it's going to look at, which is Maven Central and Clojures. So, as I said, depths.edn locally has nothing in it. If I start CLJ up on its own, we're going to get a bare bones Clojure 1.10.1 rebel. So that's the default behavior. Let's actually look at what I've got in my closure depths file. Uh, this is just the first page of it. It's pretty long. Uh, what I want to talk about here is that I have aliases called 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and so on that allow me to bring in different versions of closure. Even though the CLI and depths.edn has only uh, been around for a short while, uh, it can actually let you run Clojure in lots of old versions. And today I saw Andy Fingerhut post that you can indeed pull in Clojure 1.0.0 uh, and run really old Clojure code with a CLI tool. Now in each of these cases, it says override depths. And what this does is it will override the version of these dependencies no matter what you've already got specified. So you can specify a closure you know, 1.9 in your project and then have an alias that will override that and force the tests, for example, to run with different versions of closure, which is pretty common. That's something I do in a lot of my projects. I will run the tests with every version of closure that they're supposed to work with. You'll also see that I test against master. And in this case, the current master is 1.11.0 master snapshot. Now, regular builds of Clojure, and most other libraries, Clojure builds go to Maven Central, and most other Clojure libraries will go to Clojures. The snapshots are built to a special repo. So one of the things that I do here at the top 
is I actually specify Sona type as a repo and I specify that we should use the snapshots repository so that it can find the snapshot of Clojure when I'm running. Then we move on to the testing and debugging tools. There's already a test alias as I showed in the system install but you can override al aliases. Whatever you have in your .closure depths file will override the system one. Whatever you have in the local one will override that. By default, I have test set to find closure code in test and source test closure. So this works for standard uh, sort of new projects that have just a source and test folder. And it also works for projects that have more of a Maven structure where they have source main and closure files and source test and closure files. Uh, and generally I bring in as an extra dependency test.check. Uh, release is a shorthand, you shouldn't really use it, it's okay for de uh, development tools and it will bring in the most recent full stable release of a library. Uh, there's also latest which would bring in snapshots if available, definitely don't advise you use that. The other tool that I use a lot is Cognitect's test runner. So I have that in my .closure file so I can run tests automatically using the CLI. Again, we specify that we have extra dependencies. In this case, com.cognitect slash test runner. And we actually get it from Git. So we specify the URL to the Git repo and a SHA for the latest commit that I'm pulling the code down for. I also have the main ops in here. And this tells it to run cognitech.testrunner as a main namespace uh, and passes in the options minus D for test and minus D for source test closure. Now these are options to the test runner itself and tell the test runner where to search for test files. It doesn't automatically pick them up off the class path. You actually have to tell it where to go look for source files. Now I'm going to quit from this and show you how the class path gets built. I already showed you that we have an empty depths file here. If you ask it to describe the class path you get this long and fairly horrible looking thing but what you can do, at least on Unix, is you can translate the colons into new lines and then you can sort this. So here's how to get a, a fairly readable version of the class path. And you'll see that even in this default where I have no uh, content in my depths.edn file, it's an empty map, by default I'm picking up closure 1.10.1. That was the dependency we saw explicitly in the system depths file. But that also brings in core specs alpha and spec alpha. So this happened when uh, spec was introduced and split off into a separate library and that's why we have tools.deps it's machinery to allow closure to be run when it has its own dependencies and then source was the default paths for looking for closure source files so what we can do with this is we can say well you know what would happen if we asked for the test alias I'm using minus a that says uh, treat this as all types of uh, aliases. Uh, the aliases you can specify resource aliases, class path aliases, main opt aliases, JVM opt aliases and so on. I'll look at that in a minute. But let's just lazily say we're going to ask it to add test alias and that will bring in some more uh, things on our path. What we see now is that in addition to the dependencies above we have test.check, and it's brought in the latest release of that, which is 0.10.0 alpha 4. And it has put in the two test directories that I had in my extra depths for that. Now, if I try to run uh, Cognitex test runner here, uh, it won't do much because I don't have any tests in this folder. And you'll see it will actually go ahead and try and run the test runner at this point. Can't find any source files, so it ends up testing the user namespace, finds no tests, no assertions. Now, you don't always want 
uh, the main ops to run as well as bringing in those dependencies. So one of the things you can do is you can say, well, I only want this to affect the resources. So if you specify minus R, it will only bring in the dependencies, it won't bring in the main ops. And you'll see when I do this that I get REPL, because I haven't told it to run any main ops. And so if we go back and say, well, what was the path if we asked for the resources for the runner? And now you'll see that we have Cognitech's test runner, from uh, where it's cached into GitLibs. Uh, and you'll see that it's also brought in tools.cli and tools.namespace, which are dependencies of the Cognitech test runner. Okay, so let's go back to our, let's see, more Cognitech depths. So we've looked at a lot of this. Eastwood, we can see, is going to be the same. We bring in extra depths and main opts. Expect, I use the expectations library sometimes, so I have a quick reference for that. Benchmarks uh, bring in criterium so that I can very easily say minus a colon bench and run tests. Uh, similarly, I have measure for the CLJ memory meter, uh, so you can measure how much space is taken up by your expressions. Outdated, which brings in Olicals Depot, which is a great little library for looking for outdated dependencies in your uh, project. If you've used Linegan, you might be used to Line Ancient, which does much the same thing. And then I have a whole bunch of REPL-related tools. Uh, I have the modern NREPL, where I bring in the most recent lease and run NREPL command line. So this will start an NREPL server that you can connect to and uh, a local REPL. I have NREPL old, just in case I'm working with projects that need that, which is all Clojure Tools NREPL. And that's a little harder to get up and running. Uh, you specify a main ops where you want it to run some expressions. And this is kind of an interesting thing with depths. You can just specify a main namespace, or you can actually specify closure expressions to run. So we want it to run a require. We want it to require closure tools and REPL server and refer start server. And then we want it to start the server on port 60606. And you're looking at that and you're probably thinking, what is with all those commas? Normally, when you write that code, you'd use spaces. Well, because we have uh, shell scripts and JSON and a whole mix of things going on here, if you try it with just spaces, it will break. Uh, it will end up uh, treating each of these as separate arguments and you will get very bizarre error messages out. Fortunately though, with closure, comma is white space, and so you can specify a string that has commas in It'll pass through the shell because it doesn't think commas are anything specific, and then it'll get to closure, and closure will treat them as white space, and you're off to the races. Similar thing here for starting a socket REPL, which is what I used in my previous demo. Now, the nice thing about socket REPLs is that since closure 1.8, you can run any closure process and just specify a JVM option and it will automatically start up a socket REPL for you. And so in this case, we're specifying in the alias socket, we're specifying JVM ops, and we say minus D closure server REPL. REPL is the actual name of the REPL instance we're going to create. So you could say closure.server.foo or whatever. We want it to start on port 50505, and we want it to use this function as the accept. And the way the socket REPL works is that you can actually have different functions that will act as the accept function on the socket. So when a connection comes in, they'll start up the function. Just below that, you'll see I have PREPL. And that's very, very similar. Starts on a different port, so I can run both together. And I probably should give them different names. Uh, and it uses the IO PREPL function as the accept there. And so on and so forth, a whole bunch of different uh, aliases in here for different tools. And then down at the bottom, and I'm going to just let this run down a little further, 
In this section here, we have the dependencies for running rebel on Java 11. Above that, we have the dependencies for running rebel on Java 8, where we don't have all the JFX stuff in. We just assume it's in the JVM. Um, and this is kind of nice because this is another example of specifying dependencies and main opts. But if I want to use uh, rebel in conjunction with something else where I need the main run in that, I can say minus R colon rebel 11 and bring in just the resource paths. And as you can see, there's a lot in here. There's a new alias for working with my CLJ new library, which allows you to create new projects much the way line new does. Uh, there's uberjar for using depthstar to build a full-blown uberjar that you might want to run as a standalone app. And jar, which will create a thin jar, which is the sort of thing you might want to put among closed jars. Uh, and then finally, there's this wacky little thing down here, I discovered that Ruby has a, a minus PNE command line option, and you can cat a large file of text into it, uh, and then provide a Ruby script on the command line which will parse it and process it. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to be able to do that with Clojure. So, for example, uh, if you had a file that contained numbers on each line, you could say, uh, I want to run uh, as a main option. I want to run PNE as an alias, and then I want to run this function on it. Dollar will bind, uh, dollar underscore will bind to standard in, and the dollar script, this comes from the Ruby thing, says run this on each line. So it would actually go through and parse the first element of each line and increment it. And if you actually want to know how it's done, it's this terrifying looking thing below. So, as you can see, depths.edn, although it's just an EDN file, with the aliases, lets you do a lot of pretty fancy things. Uh, one thing that I think is kind of nice is, for example, I have been playing with the Liquid editor. And if we go ahead and pull in Rebel 11, oh, let me just check which version of Java I've got. I think it's 11. Yeah. So, uh, run liquid uh, and run rebel 11. Now, I have liquid set up so that it will automatically start rebel uh, if it's on the class path. And so, what we'll see here is liquid will start up. Uh, Liquid is essentially an in-process editor written in Clojure that behaves like Vim, which I think is just an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, and here's Rebel. So Rebel has started in the background. I'm going to stick it just down there in the corner. And if I go into Rebel, as we've seen before, you can evaluate things. So let's just see which version of Clojure we're running on. So there we go, 1.10.1. Now let's come back to Liquid. And so standard Vim keys, and I think it said Vim Fireplace, which I haven't used, but that's where it gets some of its uh, keys from. So CPP, and we see range 10 to 30 evaluated in the window there. But I've modified that in my liquid file to also send it to Rebel. So just showing that you can combine different aliases, combine different tools, and do fun stuff with them. So there you have it. It's fairly powerful. Go have a look at my dot closure file and feel free to hit me up on any of the social media or Slack or Zulip and ask me questions about it. <laughs>